So I did try and put my slide to use the slides capability in um, Jupyter Notebook, but I couldn't get it to look nice. So you're just going to have to read my notebook as I go along with it. Um, so basically, my talk's going to be about installing and running Jupyter Notebook and Pandas on EC2. And then at the end of it, I'm going to talk about using Dask and Dask Distributed to fire up a, a little cluster with very, very little effort to, to actually solve uh, problems. Okay, um, I'm going to do a bit of my talk about actually getting Jupyter Notebook set up on a new EC2 instance. And that's what I've got up here, if you notice. I'm actually hosting this on one I just made this morning. Um, so I could actually go through the steps I'm going to do in this talk. Um, so why why would you actually want to um, set up a Jupyter Notebook on EC2 instead of your own computer? Uh, there are a couple of different reasons. One, if you've got a Windows computer in a lockdown corporate environment, um, just make your sit life, life easy and do everything on a Linux machine on the cloud. Um, Two, uh, when we start talking about bigger data, um, an EC2 instance is very close to S3, so they've almost got hard disk access to um, uh, S3. So you want to store gigabytes of files, either intermediate files, or maybe your data's on there. You can just actually pull it from S3 onto your um, Jupyter Notebook really quickly. Um, and three, uh, when you want to scale up your instance and you want some uh, more horsepower, it's really easy to do by just um, shutting it down, starting again with um, anything up to a eight extra large uh, cluster computers, and that will only cost you two dollars an hour. So that thing's got a ridiculous sixty gigabytes of memory. Though, if you have a look down here, there are some will be, what is the biggest amount of memory you've got there? Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> so for $13 an hour, you can get a machine with that much memory. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, but the one I'm, I'm kind of going to be recommending is going to be, um, where is it, T2. It's not made easy to look at it, is it? Too, too large. Um, so that's the one I've been using, and that costs uh, 10 cents an hour. And so at 10 cents an hour, I kind of just leave it up all day and turn it off when I go on the holidays, especially since I've got my. Um, client's credit card hooked into that. So um, <laughs> the, the good thing about those is being a T2 instance is they are, Amazon actually scales them up and down. You see they're actually, they've got boostable here. So that means they're virtually hosted somewhere and they, they kind of give you extra credits when you run a computationally expensive task. So it means they're cheap and they can actually do the same amount of work as a um, M what, one of those M instances, or M4, M2, I can't remember what they're up to at the moment, but only if you do it in bursts, right? And they're about 10 times cheaper, well, yeah, 10 times cheaper than running an, an actual other instance. Um, so I find them quite good for hosting something, which most of the time is just sitting there waiting for me to do some work on it. Um, but when you actually want to do some work, it's, it's got that CPU behind. Um, if anyone else has any other um, opinions about any of the stuff I say here, a note, I've only been working in this ecosystem for the past three weeks, so I'll appreciate other opinions. Um, cool. Um, so even though I run Linux on my work machine, I decided to, to run this guy up on EC2. Um, I guess the disadvantage of that is I'm not going to be able to do any work on the plane. Um, and yeah, I have to pay extra money, um, which again, I'm getting my boss to pay for. So yeah, 
In the course of this talk, what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to start up a EC2 instance. I'm going to SSH to it. Um, how many people have actually used Amazon EC2 and started instances on it? Okay, cool. So that'll be a, a new one for, for a lot of you. Um, and then from scratch, I'm going to um, install um, Jupyter Notebook on it. And then basically once I've done that, I'll probably go back to using this one, which I've already set up with most of my stuff. Um, there's a lot of, um, I'm gonna put this up on the web, which I'll then post uh, on Meetup with my slides are. But there's a, there's a few links here that I used to do it. Um, some of them use the, Amazon AMI that's already set up with Jupyter Notebook on it. I decided not to do that because it's easy enough to set up and it's um, nice to see what steps you have to do if you want to set it up on your own computer. Um, most of them use um, higher security on the Jupyter Notebook than I've got on this example. And the example I've got is basically IP-based um, security, which given that when you've got Jupyter Notebook, it's really easy to just do that and be able to get um, a shell up, which straight away, um, and with this thing, we can just do a pseudo bash. Um, it's probably not a good idea to keep the security up for a long time. Right, so if you're using this for a long time, it's probably about the first thing I'm going to do tomorrow is, is actually start um, putting the proper password and, and some things in there. But at the moment, I've just got this set up so that um, only this IP address I'm using, which is probably all of AUT at the moment, um, can access this particular easy to instance. Okay, any, more, any questions, any comments? No? Okay, cool. So, um, Amazon EC2 um, basically is where you can plug in your credit card and you get uh, computers. And it's really nice, um, for instance, if you've got the kind of work where it can be scaled across lots of computers and Dask will help you do that. Because what it does is it turns the tasks that you used to think would take you know, a week on one computer. All you do is you fire up um, 100 or so computers and you can get that down to you know, a couple of hours or something. If I did the actual math, I could tell you what that is, right? Um, so, you know, Amazon will let you fire up 100 computers, 1,000 computers, and basically it's as big as your credit card limit is, and, and that's really nice to do. Yeah. So, if you have a look at this interface, so after you've gone and you've got an Amazon account, you've given them your credit card details, um, you've signed up to EC2, I think. Possibly they will send you a text message now to sign you up, just to verify you're a real person and not someone trying to scam someone's credit card. Um, there's a couple of hoops to go through, but you'll have a, um, a interface here that, that shows you what you've got. And as you can see here, this is the instance I'm actually running just so that you guys know that that's my original one and if you look down here we've got some additional data about that instance uh, all Amazon stuff has a public IP which if you notice that's the one I'm using up here to connect to um, Jupyter Notebook uh, and they've also got an internal IP which you probably don't need to know at the moment. Importantly, what you will also want to set up when you do this is you want to set up a uh, IAM role. Um, 
because if you don't do that when you initially start your instance, you can never give it a IAM role, and you want to do that if you want to have access to your own buckets on um, S3 very easily. Okay. So I'm just going to hit this launch instance, and I like Ubuntu, so I'm going to se select a 64-bit Ubuntu server, mostly because I don't like saying yum install, I'm always apt get install. Um, I said I like this instance, okay, so that's a, you know, it's probably about the size of a not a very high powered laptop. Um, configure it, don't worry about your uh, network and subnet. I'm going to have to use these later when I start um, generating a cluster, but those things will be happen, happen anyway. Um, you may want to actually um, <coughs> have an IP address assigned to it, so you don't always have to keep track of what IP it is if you've got it up for a long time. I'm not going to tell you about that. But importantly, you want to assign a IAM role to it, um, or even just create a new one. It doesn't matter if it's blank to begin with, as long as you put one in there. Um, for this one here, Basically, if you have a look at what it is, if I'm losing, you don't worry, I'll, I'll get that here. Um, you want to give it Amazon S3 full access, so that if you start putting your data on S3, which is one of the reasons why we chose to start things in Amazon, um, you can access it really, really easily. I'll give you an example of that if you want. All right, rest of it, don't really worry about too much. It's going to give you an 8 gigabyte hard drive, that's fine. I don't really worry about tags. Security group, uh, what you want to do is you want to make a nice, you want to get a nice security group for it. Um, I've got one here pre-configured, but um, you can work that out yourself. It doesn't really matter at the beginning what security group you can give it because unlike the IAM role you can change the name of security groups while the instance is running and you can change permissions while the instance is running as well um, which is really handy well, and it's telling me what's happening I'm going to start it all right the key pairs can bit, get a bit confusing when you start it off. These are basically so you can SSH into your computer. Um, I'm not really going to cover that. I'm going to leave you guys um, to work that one out yourself. Suffice it to say that I have got a key pair already generated here. Um, I have got a file on my local computer um, called smprivate.pem, which I'll be using when I want to communicate with this instance and I know how to use SSH. Um, how many people know what SSH is? Yeah. Okay, so for those that don't, SSH is just a way of uh, getting a command line up on a, a remote computer that all Linux computers use and it's really secure and works. There used to be, um, but then I think that he got rid of it. Right, so you used to be able to have some sort of JavaScript um, uh, SSH client, but I think they just decided that wasn't secure enough. Okay, so here's the one I just started. Is this a size big enough for everyone to see, or do I need to make it bigger? That's fine. Um, new. 
So I've got this one sitting in there. Now the only real important thing you have to do is grab your public IP, and then you're going to want to SSH into that. While that's starting up, I'll actually show you what you've got to do for the security group. So there's two things you need to do. You need to be able to SSH into your machine. Um, key, SSH with key pairs is really secure, so you're actually okay um, having that from anywhere on the internet. But if you wanted to, you could um, tie that down to whatever your IP is at the moment. Okay, and, and then you've got a quite a nice secure instance there. It's going to check your key file, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, what I've done here is because you've got um, Jupyter Notebook that you're going to want to do at some point, you're going to have to do HTTP on port 8888. And that one there, you don't want to let open to anywhere in the internet because I turned off the passwords on that one. And um, that's going to be really insecure for someone who's going to get turned on. I would suggest you follow the uh, security configuration mentioned in those files for setting a password and having much more secure stuff. Outbound, um, you just allow it to have outbound traffic everywhere, so that's okay. Back to dashboard. Yes, I've got two running instances. So now I've got an instance running on this public IP address. Right, so that's how I got to my old one. So this is just using SSH from the command line. You might want to bump that up a little bit. Um, the only difference here is you've got a, this file which contains my security key, um, which is just sitting in my local directory. And because we're doing an Ubuntu instance, you have to remember that the username is Ubuntu. This is a real hassle with SSH every time you get a new IP address. It says, do you trust this guy? And because it's EC2, your IP addresses are going to move out. All right, so now I'm here. I can start installing um, Jupyter Notebook on this machine. So I go back to my other one. And basically, I've got these two commands to do it. I'm choosing the Anaconda installation because that really comes with everything. And um, it's quite nice because it installs a new Python uh, that you don't have to sudo into to, to install everything. And one of the advantages of actually having uh, another machine to do this kind of stuff is you don't really have to worry about polluting your machine with lots of Python packages that you may never use or may never get or something because it's a completely different machine. Right? So you don't have to worry about keeping your your work one or your, your home one um, clean. So if you have a look at Anaconda, it'll tell you how to install it. And then it says to do this. wget is just going to download this file in my local directory. One of the great things about being on EC2 is you have awesome internet access there, so everything's really fast. And then if we have a look, we've got that file, and we have to run it with bash actually, you know, you can't just do so much, right? And it's going to tell you to look at the license agreement, this key to go, your approval of the return, install it in the default. So who here uses Anaconda Python? Yeah, is, is there any, because I just started using it, are there any 
bad things about using it. I found out something in that recently the two feet part of it just broke. I don't know whether I can use it. It was really good for having and not having to install all the uh because that part of the thing is be a bit of a bit annoying to install. Yeah. Yeah. So just it was great, like you install that economy you've got not just patterns but all the different plotting and scientific packages, just all the different all the different so, so that's that's basically why I chose it because it's it's just easy to get everything installed. Um, so, uh, the Anaconda Python distribution. So you, you've already got Python installed on this machine by default since it's a uh, Linux machine, but uh, it's just handy having a, a separate Python, that's not system Python. Yeah. Yeah, so it's got heaps of these packages up here. That, you know, it's got stats models. These, these are all there. So it's really kind of a, uh, a distribution, they call it. So it's Python. That's what it is. They also have their own package manager. So you don't need to use Pip. Although I think you can. They have one called Thunder, which is, which is um, has a whole bunch of pre-compiled binary um, kind of packages specifically for scientific, well, more generally for scientific use. So some of those can be really tricky to compile yourself if you're just going to standard Python route, whereas this one is just like a one line. And it's more up to date as well than um, just a normal like um, debugging distribution. So. Probably wouldn't be great for web development. So if you're going to do more app or like an application you're going to make, Probably wouldn't be so useful. They're going to do more of it on the scientific Yeah, so normal Python at this point here, I'd start pip installing Jupyter Notebook, but since I'm using Anaconda, I do conda install. And I don't have to have root access. And that's just saying, say yes to everything and do it quietly. Um, so now I've got. Um, Jupyter installed, there's that little bit of configuration I have to do to turn off security. Don't, don't hate me, it's just a little bit easier to do this demonstration without having to um, think about it too much. And we go into this file. And we add the magic lines, which uh, serve Jupyter Notebook on every IP address, um, and don't open the browser. Ah. Right. Now, at this point here, I'm going to introduce you to something called Tmux. Tmux is kind of like Screen. Uh, how many people have used any of those two tools? Yeah. Okay, so what's basically going to happen here is since we're running a um, computer remotely, um, if I just run a process now um, and start Jupyter Notebook, as soon as um, I log out of the session in SSH, Jupyter Notebook will start working. Okay? So what you want to do is you want to have some way of, of basically storing a command line um, still going, a process still going on your EC2 computer and then attaching to it and detaching to it as you want so that it doesn't really stop when you um, there. You could, if you wanted, just run it with no pup and stuff like that, but uh, using something here, two marks, or screen, starts me in a, a little session here, so I can go cd, uh, sorry, mapdir notebook, these commands are all on that notebook, I'm going to make it public, cd notebook. And then you start it up.
Cool. So now we, it says it's got a server running. Right. And now we just press Control B and D. I haven't got those in there. And I've detached and I can just exit out of there. So this is my local computer now. And then when I want to get back into it, I can SSH again. And then I can get back to that section with two months attached. And it's still there for me. So it hasn't hasn't gone away. So that's that's a trap for young players. Um, when they close their SSH session, their Jupyter notebook goes away and they're like, I don't log into it anymore. You know, so uh, use something like Screen or, or Tmux to um, help that. Oh, yeah, fine. And now just to test that everything's working fine. Yay! <laughs> So, um, what you can do now, and I've been using this feature a lot, is if you want to open the terminal, you can actually just open the terminal now from, from Jupyter. And internally, that's actually using a Tmux as well. Um, so, if you wanted to do values here or, or do things there, that, that could work out. Of course, what's actually going to happen when you do this is it'll probably say something like, uh, connection refused because this is where you have to go here and make sure that you've got the security group to let yourself um, connect to it via HTTP. Okay, so that that doesn't come to default with the instance. You have to actually go and add that, um, but that that will be what's happening if you then can't. You get to know a lot about these security groups and, and so on uh, because uh, Amazon are actually quite good at shutting stuff down um, and giving you security if you want it. So if you wanted to share your notebook with somebody, could you just open up the... Yeah, so you can add another port there. Um, I think they recommend... There's another project which will actually is meant for more multi-user usage. Um, I haven't really looked into that. But yes, if you wanted to open the notebook to someone else, what you'd do is you'd add your IP address here. Or do the proper security thing and just give them the password. I'd probably actually recommend using the password and filtering the IP addresses, to be honest. Uh, just because uh, it's such a big security hole, uh, having someone being able to run um, directly get a root shell on your machine. Um, I'm, I'm surprised that you know Russian hackers haven't taken over this machine already. To be honest. Um, okay. Uh, any other questions about just installing um, Jupyter Notebook? I imagine if anyone's interested, they just go and have a look at the instructions I've got here. Posted in the GitHub group that you can also just type tmdmd.org and have the same screen. Oh, okay. And you're just a lot of configuration. Oh, no, like, okay. It's there under that URL. Oh, cool. Um, right. Uh, so, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, like, you're using Tmux over here to like, not stop our notebook. Yeah, yeah. Our so, uh, is it possible to like make it the background process and uh, work when I log out of this? Yeah, well, um, that would be a bit of configuration you'd have to do, set up the daemon. Most most of the stuff. I mean, normally what I have like, I do is divide a notebook and put a hand sign. It just goes into background. Yeah, but you're going to have to want to put a no hub after that okay. as well, so that you can actually close your shell. But the problem with doing that is then you can't. Stop it explicitly. Uh, well, yeah, you'd have to kill it, stuff like that. Um, Tmux is just 
handy and to get in there, but I, I'll be surprised if there isn't a way to set it up so that as soon as the incident starts going, the jet the nothing starts. Um, when I had this installed before, it actually gave me an access token on that page. Um, but for some reason, this particular installation from Anaconda is not set up that way, um, which is why I needed to actually see what the access token was. But um, this here is the full token one. Any other questions? This room's actually quite hot, isn't it? Yeah. Well, maybe, maybe they actually turn on, maybe the switch can turn on every time and just send it. As it just automatically turns on. Oh well, we'll add that to our list um, <coughs> the next time. Right. So now we're on to the actual fun bit of the talk, where I say, let's play around with Jupyter Notebook and, and look at some data. Right, um, so what I was told that I wasn't allowed to use my data set from work um, because we're not allowed to tell people that we know how to do sciencey things at work. Uh, we, we keep our tools to ourselves. So um, what I'm doing is I'm playing around with uh, the New Zealand electricity market uh, database. So um, put your hand up if you know what the New Zealand electricity market is. Oh, okay, cool. Um, so basically, New Zealand, when they had the electricity reforms, they put in one of the most forward-looking electricity markets in the world. Um, so every half hour, on 200 nodes, on which are locations in New Zealand, either suppliers or um, sellers of electricity, uh, either suppliers or demand of electricity, um, there is a price work down. Okay, this is all done by solving a big uh, network flow optimization, taking into account losses going from point to point, taking into account people's demand. Um, for instance, wind farms always put in a bid that says they want to sell all of their electricity at zero dollars um, because, you know, if they don't sell their electricity, it just gets dumped. Um, and I uh, say Huntley when Huntley was using coal generation, it'll put out a, um, a price for its electricity saying how much it would be to generate a um, megawatt of electricity from coal. What then happens is they work out the demand of each node, um, they work out how much electricity they need supplied, where's the cheapest it's going to come from, what the transmission losses are, blah, 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 it all gets very complicated. Um, but then they sell at the marginal price. So that means even though the wind farms have said that they're going to supply you at electricity at zero dollars, if Huntley does have to come online and it says I'll sell you at a hundred dollars, um, the wind farms will get their hundred dollars too. Okay, so that's how electricity prices are set in New Zealand, which is why we get things like in the news you may have heard there was Time last week, or was it two winters ago, where there was this huge spike, you know, 100 times normal prices because, you know, basically uh, the hydro lakes started saying we really don't want to sell electricity um, and this is really expensive, so electricity got really expensive. Um, so, New Zealand electricity market is very complicated. For instance, if you look at Australia, they have five nodes covering the whole country and we have 200. Um, which means it's quite an interesting problem to look at um, if you want to look at big data sets. Um, so if you go to uh, the Electricity Authority, it's got a whole bunch of data sets here going from uh, 1996 October to um, November 2016. And each of these are a month's worth of data for 200 nodes in the New Zealand electricity market, uh, being the final prices uh, every half hour. Okay, so medium-sized data. 
probably difficult to load all of that onto one machine. All right, but you don't really need to go all out and you know buy a hundred machines and do it on a supercluster, um, supercomputer. So first, I'll I'll do an example of why putting stuff on S3 and working with pandas is really nice, um, because pandas will just simply read data from S3, and provided you have that IAM role set up that says, I want to let this computer access my S3 data, it will automatically access uh, your private S3 data as well, under the same um, login name. If you haven't set up that IAM role, even if it was empty, and now you go back and say, oh, I want to let it access our S3, uh, you will have trouble doing this step. Okay, and boom. So um, I've read in the CSV, you see here it's got the trading date, trading period, no price. I've asked for the top of it with head. If I didn't put that in, one of the great advantages of Pandas is that it has really nice representations of things. Um, so you can really muck around with your data and, and see what's happening. So you see here it's got all your data from January the 1st, 1997 down to uh, the 31st of January. Um, there, so you can check there's all that data sitting in there. Uh, head's a lot easier when you're doing a presentation because it doesn't take up so much space. Um, there's also described, which I haven't tried to do that. No which does some nice stuff that shows you how many different prices, what the means of all the prices were, et cetera, et cetera. One of the things that you notice here is that it's picking up trading period and treating it as a number, whereas it actually should be a category. Uh, because at 48 half hour blocks during the day, uh, there's no real reason why it should have a mean. Okay. Um, Square bracket. Oh, the first one, yeah. Anyway, so only the first one line, um, row. Now, I'm pressing Shift Enter on all of these cells to get them to run, uh, which, after you've been using Pandas for a day, just becomes automatic, but can be quite confusing um, when you want to do it. Um, otherwise, what you can do here is, by the default view, um, is you can press, I've never done this, run. And if something takes a really long time, maybe you've done a loop to infinity, uh, interrupt kernel here is, is quite convenient. Right. Um, if you want to just put data here, you can choose a different type of cell. I'm not really going to go into a lot more Canvas stuff, um, Jupyter Notebook stuff. Um, it's quite easy just to have a play around and there's plenty of stuff there. Okay, so we've selected here the first cell. The other thing you can do here is you can just put, oh, that's a P. You can tell they probably generated this on a window machine because they've all got capitals everywhere, all the file names of capitals in them. It's really fun. Um, and you can just get um, columns out that way as well, as well as rows. So, for those of you that's wondering what's what's going on underneath, um, it keeps basically a Python um, uh, REPL, is it called a REPL? No, it's called a command line in Python. A REPL. Um, it keeps one of those um, going underneath. So if you declare a, a variable in there, which I'm going to do next, um, that variable will hang around your, your session. I can come back to it in three days. As long as you don't restart your computer, I restart the EC2 computer, or um, do this um, 
restart up here for the kernel. All right, so that's actually one of the other reasons why it's handy to have an EC2 instance, which you keep on. Cool, so I have looked at the starter. I can see a few things. One trading date should be a date. Okay. All right, so I've told it to uh, pass the dates and trading date. This is a really handy function here because um, argument to read CSV because it just picks up the date for quite a lot of different formats, like if you have minutes and so on as well. Um, you can tell it what columns it should index in, um, which, to be honest, sometimes gets to be more of a pain in the ass uh, than it's worth because I'll show you. So now when we look at month data, it's now moved these things into indexes, which makes it great when you want to plot it. But when you want to then access it, I can't now go and get all the node data from it because it recognizes it as a level. Uh, which you can still get, but it's a pain in the ass. So when I want to actually see what all the node data is there, I do this little thing called reset index, which puts it back to what you saw before and say, why the unique ones? Okay. So these are all the kind of things you want to do to ensure data hygiene. Um, when you're loading in lots of data, you want to just make sure everything's right, you've got the range of dates you expect. It's really easy to do in Pandas. Next thing here is you can do queries. Uh, Odahu 2201 is basically Auckland prices. So I can now say get me the Auckland prices for January 2000, uh, 90, January 1997. Um, and it will go and it filters out and finds uh, all of those prices, all right? Which means we can do this. Boom. And you see that's a um, graph of all of the prices in Auckland for January 1997 um, by half hours, which is a really cool thing that um, having Jupyter Notebook does. And the unfortunate thing is you have to remember to put that line in when you want to actually see these things. Okay, um, I saw somewhere in Stack Overflow how to get it working automatically. I haven't seen how to do it. Does anyone know how to get that to run on any notebook? I think maybe in your content file that you can oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. do it there as well. Because that's another one of the gotchas, especially when you reset the kernel, um, which I'll just, yeah, I won't do here. It will come up and it will just print this bit here. Um, and it won't actually print um, this. Now, when you actually look, have a look at what's happening behind here, that what's happening is this um, X um, subplot object here is providing a HTML representation. I think that gets picked up by Jupyter Notebook. And it means that there's quite a few things you want to do if you want to customize stuff. and I've seen people actually doing a JavaScript pivot table um, where you can actually live shift around the data and stuff. So there's there's a lot of magic going on back here, um, which makes it really cool. Uh, yeah, so Pandas provides a, a plot function here, which does a lot of the defaults that you would expect it to do first time. Um, so the reason I made these guys indices when I loaded it, even though I said it was a pain in the ass immediately afterwards, is because it knows that you then want to see a plot of the price against its index. Um, if you want to, you can customize it by doing something like uh, just do a reset index. There's a better way of doing this kind of stuff, tell me, but if you just want to see a trading period against. I 
means price. You can do it like that. Yeah. yeah. So you probably want to sort that or um, actually do it column wise. There's a few pink examples I've got there, but um, the important thing is that the plot command actually does a lot in the magic for you if you have reasonable data. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. That'd be handy. Um, I'll have a look at that. Um, right. So, what's other things you can do? You can do aggregation behavior. So, um, what I want to do here is I want to take all the data for Auckland, and I want to say look at it over the trading date. So that means all of the um, periods are going to be collapsed. I then say I want to take the mean of all of those uh, trading periods and see if we get the magic out. Ah, yeah, cool. So it looks weird here because what it's actually done is it's taken the mean of basically 1 to 48. And you see that's 12.5 quite nicely. But it's also, also giving you the mean of the actual prices. Okay, so this kind of aggregation stuff is really powerful. And you'll want to be using quite a lot of the stuff to do map reducing kind, kind of things, especially if you want to start doing it using on bigger data sets. Because this will actually end up coming out automatically, which is a really cool thing I'm going to show you, hopefully, when I get to the end. Um, And you can do, um, you can apply any function there. Um, so you can actually supply your own Lambda functions there if you want to do something specific to that data. And there's a whole bunch of things you can do. You're basically mapping over this group by. Of course, the first thing that people will do is this. Try and look at it. Yeah, oh. One of the unfortunate things is they don't have a nice representation of these group by objects by default. Um, it would be kind of nice if they actually had some sort of table that said you've got a count of, of six things here. Um, I think this works. Let's see. Oh, yeah. So basically, if you get rare, I'll just, if you just look at price here, it'll actually show you the quartiles and, and maximum of um, all of those trading periods, which is quite useful. And trading period still sitting there as a category, as a as a number. I should call it a category, but so there's a whole lot of things you can use to look at your data. But let's have a look at some more pretty graphs. Oh, um, I actually didn't need to do this, but quite often uh, you may find that you need a package and you haven't got installed on the machine. There's a little bit of magic that Jupyter Notebook does by just putting a um, exclamation mark here. It actually just runs that on the command line. So quite often you want to install a package. You don't actually have to go back here and go conga install. You can just go hit here and hit conga install there. You can also use, I think it's, no, it's percent percent, isn't it? I think that's what you do. And that'll actually do the same thing, except you can put multiple commands there. See, this is like the period of training the ones. Okay, cool. Now, I already had that installed, but if you didn't, that would install it. It's not by default in, uh, in a combo. 
And it means you can do cool things like this. So here you see now a nice box plot of all of the dates in that month. Right? So you can actually get an idea of the distribution of the data across there. Um, you can do other things like maximum instead of the mean, and you can decide what. Ah, that's right. Tell it to specifically pick up Auckland. So they'll start telling you what the maximum of the trade price is um, for each of those days. And one of the really cool things you can do is you can start unstacking stuff. Um, okay, what does unstack do? If you've looked at the data here, you see that no is actually a identifier for each row. What happens if I want to turn it into a new column? I run unstack, and we'll turn my data into this. You see that that's You've now got price by every node, and you've got it's like a pivot table in Excel. And then when you go here, I got rid of the legend because there's too many stuff things in the plot. You can actually see how price is changing by um, during you know, during the day, the month, and the trading period. Um, by each of the different nodes. So you see they're actually quite highly correlated except for these two dates, um, which will be probably something you'd want to look into if you were more interested in the start of it in more time. Okay, so any questions about that? Loading a data set in and playing around with it? No? Oh, so what happens when your data gets bigger? Okay, so the interesting thing here is one of the things that um, people get when they start getting bigger data sets is they actually start running out of memory before they run out of computational power. Um, and that's usually because they say, I just want to load all of those 240 files. <laughs> And, and see what's going across, what's going to happen. Um, now, that will be fine because maybe you actually want to see just for Auckland what the prices have been for the last 20 years. Right? And remember, each of those files are all of the nodes per month. So to get the Auckland data out, you would actually have to run all of those um, files and then extract the Auckland data out of them, and then you're only left with a one two hundred for the size, so you're back to the size of you know one month, but you've got to go and load all those things into memory at the same time. Maybe a hassle, blah blah blah. It may block out your computer, um, but if you've been listening to this talk, you can load this thing called DAS. Um, so Dask, DAS, probably Dask. I don't know, you can probably say DAS or something like that. Um, so you've got this um, um, object here, which pretends it's a data frame like a normal Pandas data frame, but allows you to do cool things like, oh, hang on, you're loading from file, but instead of a particular file, I just want to do a, a glob, all right? So this here is going to load all of the 2016 data. It's going to allow you to do a lot of the things that you wanted to do before. For instance, you can't set the index when you're doing a read CSV here. There's a kind of few things you can't do, uh, but it does allow you to do a lot of things. Oh, 
Oh, that was quick. Why? Because it hasn't actually done anything, right? So it's lazily doing stuff. It will allow you to work out a data frame from this. Yeah. So now it's busily going and actually reading in those 12 files and, and outputting them here. But it will also, well, there's a couple of things going on here. When it does this compute, um, it does it in partitions, right? So it will actually try and conserve your memory, et cetera, et cetera. And two, you can actually do stuff on your best data, da best data, um, and try and shrink it down into a more reasonable data set, even if it starts with being really huge. Okay, so what's the example here? Uh, I just want to see for Auckland um, what the mean is over all of the trading periods. So basically in a typical, typical Auckland day, you get your lump in the morning where everyone's making breakfast and you get a lump at night where, I don't know, stuff's happening. People are making dinner, cleaning up the ovens, doing their washing probably. Um, all right, so that's gone and done that for all of 2016. Right, but we want to get bigger. Da -da -da. And it made it do on one of my, on this one computer. Okay, so this is this is the, the final thing I'm going to do here, but I'm just going to take the time uh, a little bit more of it because I think it's really cool. Um, distributed will allow you to run DAS data frames and so on on many computers uh, really, really easily. Um, I would have actually had to do this further up, by the way. Um, but let's start a cluster with this tool called Desk EC2, which you'd have to install as well. I'm not going to go into details here because the magic is awesome. All right, so basically there's this tool here which will go and fire up by default four computers, but I'm going to live a little and make it six. With some extra stuff here, just because EC2 wants me to have a subnet and EPC. Um, I'm going to give it that role here so it can access EC2. And I'm going to make it uh, this instance. Okay, I wouldn't actually recommend using T2 um, instances for clusters. Um, probably because you, you're just going to have one work one thing you want the cluster to do and then take it down again. Um, so you don't need the burstable ones, but I'm going to put them on here because they're cheaper. Um, and this will go and start them all up and provision them for me. And I started this now because it takes about five minutes. <laughs> There we go. You see it's starting to get all of these instances running. Do you have to do anything special to allow your first instance to be able to create new instances? Yeah. running inside your, um, your first instance you made, right? Yeah, so that's why you need the IAM role as well. Um, if you have a look here, um, I have a Jupyter Notebook IAM role. And the good thing about these is you can add them while the thing's running. But this has got uh, full access to EC2 to start that stuff. And it's also easy to add that as well. So this is what you're saying, if someone could access that tell it to run thousands of instances of Yeah, and, and directly go into my credit card. Yeah. Yeah. And 
We've lost some hair here. Um, sorry, I'm sure there are Chinese hats and American hats as well. Um, okay, we're on again. So yeah, so that's got them got them all up and running now, and is now going to install uh, basically the Anaconda Python distribution on each of those workers because you want them to do Python stuff, right? And that's what takes the most time. But in the meantime, I'm just going to tell it to use my local machine. Once I get the IP address for the head of the cluster, I'll pop it in here. And I'm going to tell it, okay, just to read in this 2016 data. Oh, no, let's see, I was going to make it 2000. Because I want to show year by year here, so I'm going to just start two years. Okay, and basically what I want to do here is I want to take all of this data, I want to group it by the trading period, and find the meaning of, mean of it. So exactly what we did here. But now I want to do it over two years instead of one. Okay, and it's said, okay, I haven't computed this yet. But one of the really cute things you can do here is, oh, what's going to go happen when I do this? Yeah. So um, this here shows all the computations that will happen when I want that calculation. So I really think that's cool, but let's make it a bit smaller. Six, and we'll get all of. So we'll just do it for three months in this case. And you see here, two months, sorry, because we don't have December 2016. Um, Dask is automatically generating this task network, which means it knows it can run these two things here on the left node at the same time, right? So that, that's kind of what you're getting for free for Dask. It's, it's actually working out how things work. And also it has really smart algorithms to say, if you're running this on a computer, which one, how to keep the data local and stuff. So if it knows these two things have to come together at some point, we'll try and run them on the same computer so it doesn't have to move the data around a lot. It's really quite impressive what it does. Um, just running this on my machine here. Of course it works it out because I only set it for two months of data. Still waiting for that to install. That took a while. So the next thing I'm going to want to do is when I do load everything, I'm going to say all of 2000 and because when you're working on these things it's always easiest to do it on small stuff first. I'm just going to say for two years I want to then take these years, these dates here and make them into an actual year column. All right? Um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that year and unstack it and plot it. Let's just do this locally. Got that. I met that there. What's the most number of things you spun up to do analysis? Um, I've only spun up ten at the moment, but 
I'm probably going to actually have to start a cost with like 50 that we can buy. Uh, because we have a lot of data that we are putting. So you see that kind of takes a long time at the moment just doing that. Uh, oh yeah, cool. And if we want to see what that data looks like, is what I've done here is I've extracted the year, right? The reason I want to do that is because I didn't want to unstack it properly. And so you can see how the years are different and how demand may be changing over year. And let's go in the time. Um, so given that that's probably got about another two minutes uh, to run before the cluster up, it usually takes about two minutes. Does anyone have any questions? Was something else installed? Yeah, so um, Pandas doesn't need it, but Dask does to um, access S3. Um, uh, I, think it, I think it needs that because it does this uh, globbing function. But um, Dask is actually really quite good because it will actually say, if you haven't got this, uh, please import it. Um, at one point, I mean, this, this visualized thing is actually a pain in the ass because you actually have to install graphers and Anaconda doesn't do a really good job with graphers apparently. Um, so you have to go and install it from APT. But when I tried to run this visualize with the Anaconda install, it came up and says, oh, I can't do this. It's probably because of this problem with Anaconda. Here's the issue. <laughs> and so the error message actually had the, um, 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 the URL of the issue on Anaconda. Uh, so the Dask people do kind of um, keep their stuff up to date. Like one of the things in this cluster, um, they changed the server over. So because it's got a visualization tool attached to that cluster. So they, they changed the library it was using as a Boca, something happened there. And then Dask, within a couple of days, had changed the um, Dask, so it was doing the right thing. So they're actually quite on top of it, but I guess it's because they're at the top of quite a shaky stack of software. Like, it, it does seem to do magic, but there's, there's a lot of elephants on the way down, and if one of them has a bit of a hiccup, um, you have to be really on top of it. Um, I have, I haven't used it, but yeah, tell me that. I think Dask is, is kind of more an abstraction on top, right? So it tries to take um, all of the work generating this graph and even the work is um, out of your hands, so you don't have to type in the data. Uh, whereas I think even PySpark, you, you're still quite close to your data. I haven't used PySpark, has anyone? Yeah? Would that be a... You can get PySpark. Oh, okay. Um, one, of, one of the cool things I noticed about Dask is it does... Um, have a delay object that you can start adding to your own library. So if you've ever used a, a mocking platform or so on, you get an idea of what the Dask delayed object has. Basically it says, you turn in function and you just say, I am delayed. And then you start doing, if you then pass that into further functions, uh, instead of actually doing anything to the function, so you're like summing up the results of delay, it will then basically store this and say, oh, you want to sum it. And you just keep on remembering what you want to do to it. And then it can build up a tree like this. And then when you say compute, it will actually go back and, and do all of the stuff, trying to keep into account memory and, and CPU as well. 
Yay! Uh, so I've got that up, and I have a cluster of six amazing machines. Right, we've got this this nice little interface there to make sure that we're actually doing stuff. Um, I then say, oh, where's the head machine and how do I talk to it? There we go, back up here. I like the way shortcuts still work here, so control slash does that. I say, instead of doing this locally, connect to my fabulous machine. And if you have a look at it, it'll go flying. And it says it's got 10 cores and five machines. So unfortunately that EC2, it, it keeps one machine just as the, the head node, which doesn't really make sense when you've got small clusters, but you know, if you're running 100 clusters, you want to keep the head node separate. Um, let's go and redo this stuff. Now, previously I've gone through and computed it and then done these operations, right? Now I'm just going to do these operations. Ah. And that isn't working. Why? Yeah, maybe. Oh, I'll, I'll fall back to the just doing the same um, things, which remember this here is there's it's picking on there. I don't want to compute that. Oh well, unfortunately I am just going to have to get you guys to believe me, but I will. Um, so we'll load all 2001 data. Boom. And Go compute. Yeah, it's not really what I wanted to do, but it will show you feeding all of those file reads um, across the cluster. So the fact that this just happens automatically, and I've just got one line of code there to tell it to print the cluster, I think it's amazing. Um, but even if you don't have a cluster, using Dask is really quite good because it, it sorts everything. In uh, fine. Okay, sorry I didn't get that final thing there, but um, I will try and endeavor to work out what I'm doing and put it in the uh, public one of those. Thanks, guys. That reminds me of Hadoop and Spark, mm. how, how that whole thing works, because this seems to work with EC2 and in its own. Hmm. Hmm. Because Spark's got its own director as well. I'm going to do the machine fails. Yeah, yeah, he's doing that. He's lost Let's test that out. You're going to kill a machine. He's going to kill a machine. I'll be trying to figure out the machines that are in here. Which ones are going to come up as good? Well, it's just wondering about that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe this is what machines love. And they're actually really enjoying it. And when we thin that machine, that's where they have a problem. 
Feel that, baby. Oh, look, it's got all the... What's your Terminator photo? Yeah. It wasn't the master one. Right? No. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> Zero. <laughs> come, come. Come. <laughs> Power's going pretty good. Look at that. Wow. Wow. That's awesome. I did turn the capture back on so you can do that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it for the whole data set, just to... But I like the way that it's not until the computer, it's just there, you know? Yeah. Boom. And then... Oh, look, it's got one big machine. Where'd that come from? <laughs> Damn it! Now it works, everyone, it works now. Look, look, <laughs> gaze upon its beauty. And and then what you must do is... Yeah, I'm 